Hello, I'm William Calvin, a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Our kind of language is the fourth in a series of lectures on human evolution. Our kind of language hopes you gossip about who did what to whom, where, when, and with what means. But how do you enable someone else to read your mind, to reconstruct all of your model of the action inside their head? To help that person guess well while mind reading you, you use the syntax of long sentence language. To review what we talked about last time, we were concentrating on a recipe for the big brain that had six essential parts in it. Number one was having grazing animals as meat supply rather than just herbivores in general and large grazers, not small bodied grazers. So, what limits the numbers of grazers, the population size, during a boom and bust? We discussed that brush fires are frequent and the tails plant secession after a fire. We discussed traditional Darwinism, particularly the excess reproduction uh, that's so wasteful but provides the means of changing the relative proportions of traits in the population. We discussed in the context of the brush uh, surrounding a grassland, the assertive mating genetics. Uh, we discussed versatility, things like tool making, food preparation, and such, uh, would tend to concentrate in the brushy shade. Finally, we discussed how all this leads to trait hitchhiking, how traits get more or less a free ride uh, without the usual constraints imposed by uh, selective survival, which normally is what drives most evolutionary change. All this, all six traits, enable a bush, a boom and bust feedback loop that improves versatility, but does it via enlarging the brain first. We expect omnivores to need bigger brains than grazers just to house all the additional brain specializations needed for acquiring each food. Versatility is a good part of what we call intelligence, as is creativity, as are quick, high quality decisions. We'll discuss more next time. So why is shade important for human evolution? There are tasks that use both hands, which require long periods of close attention, thus done in the shade, creating sharp edges. Food preparation, pounding, soaking, cooking. Fire starting. So some individuals hang out in the brush adjacent to a grassland more than others do. That means associative mating occurs amongst those practicing these shady arts, tool making, food prep, fire starting. This works just like mating amongst the more versatile as among those who can pass the college entrance exams. Here's what a brushy tree area looks like after a fire. And this is only two months and you already see all this new grass growing. The theory made some predictions that less effective loops, once you get outside of the Rift Valley where the feedback loop works very well, that less effective loops may have influenced non-ancestral homo species, like Neanderthal, as they immigrated into environments where there were fewer suitable sites for the feedback loop. So the prediction was that you'd expect slower brain enlargement when they spread into the European forests where 
there are no brush fires uh, to operate next to grassland. Or when they spread into the steppes of Central Asia, where there are certainly grass fires, uh, but there is very little brush compared to the great volume of grassland, and that makes the increment from a feedback loop very small. So here's the uh, result of that prediction. On the left, we see brain size increasing starting at about 2.3 million years ago, just after grazers evolved. And grazers evolving is what's needed to start the feedback loop running. Because they, unlike the herbivores in general, get a big population boom each time there is a brush fire. So on the left, we're plotting brain size only for Homo sapiens and our ancestors, our direct ancestors. So it's leaving out Neanderthals and it's leaving out the Asian uh, Homo erectus. On the right, you see what we left out over on the left. And we see Asian Homo erectus. This is just plotting for reference with that dotted line. So you can see how far below the uh, trend line uh, Asian Homo erectus is. And then here, here shows sort of the offset. They're delayed by a good three tenths of a million years. There are Neanderthals. And they're mostly below the line, except for those light ones above the line. Now, the ones above the line are a special case. That's interbreeding with Homo sapiens. We got a lot of Neanderthal genes that way, and it appears that they got some big brain genes from Homo sapiens. So all of those large brain points for Neanderthal are in the Neanderthal's final 31,000 years. So the setup for the creative explosion is sort of odd. Sharp edge tool technique, which other than javelins is just about the only thing they did. This technique improved only twice about every one and a half million years. In between, there wasn't much change. So why so slow, so conservative? Second item, by 200,000 years ago, people looking like us were around, Homo sapiens at last, complete with our big brain, but they weren't doing much different until 100,000 years ago. The creative explosion that occurs then is just before the out of Africa of Homo sapiens at about 70,000 years. This is the out of Africa that spread modern Homo sapiens in the East African population into Asia with a few into Europe. These uh, lower set of lines here that you see. Uh, I doubt really they crossed the Red Sea, but uh, they certainly did follow coastlines uh, once you get across India, uh, all the way down into Indonesia, and in periods when the sea level was particularly low. Uh, it, once they got across the strait, um, The, um, where the Wallace line is, uh, they made it all the way into Australia, certainly by 45,000 years, maybe 50. The out of Africa into Europe, that you see on the left part, the black line going up into Europe, uh, that was more like 40 to 50,000 years.
During all this period, climate was flipping back between two basic modes. Up to warm and wet, like today, and then back down into a cool and dry, often uh, a few centuries later. These flips could be very fast. And there are two dozen of these cycles uh, in the last 75,000 years. Such instability probably happened during prior glaciations as well. So here's the period to of anatomically modern humans, and then behaviorally modern coming in here. The, here's the out of Africa into Asia, the out of Africa into Europe. And at about that time, 40,000 years, this is when the Neanderthal is going extinct. But it's also about when representational art in Europe gets going from 50 to uh, wall art in about 40. So before this 70,000 year out of Africa into Asia, there were one and a half million year long periods when the tool making didn't improve. Now, were they just overly conservative? You know, was it against their religion or something? Uh, but constant cultural loss, then somebody having to reinvent it. I mean, if your expert dies before training a replacement, it's lost to everybody. And Tasmania appears to be an example of this 13,000 years ago when it got cut off from Australia. Uh, they happened to lose their fire starting ability. And there was no way to regain it by uh, somebody walking down uh, from Australia. But of course, number three here was imitation and teaching unlikely to spread an innovation over a larger region. One has to assume that all these advances occurred many times. They were invented many times. They were just lost many times until they spread over a wide enough area to escape some of the inevitable loss that you get with small numbers. At any rate, how this worked out, are, these are really unanswered questions for now. About 80 to 90,000 years ago, the first signs of all this, uh, one started seeing barbs made, they were sort of carved out of bone. Uh, this is a, a decorated version, undated, uh, where uh, some lines have been engraved and things. And again, about 77,000 years ago, near the southernmost tip of Africa, Lumbus Cave, uh, are two interesting findings. One is, is this piece of red ochre. Uh, red ochre is a favorite substance for decorating your cheeks. It's rouge, basically. Now make a paste of it, and you get lipstick. Things like this seem to have gotten started back then. Uh, and Bloombo's cave also has necklaces made of shells. Uh, the holes in them uh, were probably made by a boring predator, and they were simply utilized uh, by being strung on something. Uh, on the right here, you see an example of uh, not just shells, but here's a tooth with a hole in it. Uh, these are drilled holes. Now, representational art seems to have gotten started about 50,000 years ago. This particular uh, mammoth tusk uh, is undated, but uh, this, this sort of thing began to be seen back at 50,000. Now, what you see here, if you haven't figured out by yet, uh, there is the head of a mammoth here and his tusk. You can see the eye of the mammoth. And you can trace it all the way back now. So K 
carrying your ark around with you as you moved was the first thing. Here's a more advanced form at 25,000 years along the Danube. And by 37,000 years ago, art began to be seen carved or painted on the walls of caves. Now, cave art as a term was earlier applied to those figurines I showed you, simply because people were digging into the floor of caves in order to find them or they got lost. But then somebody looked up at the walls and noticed that there are things like this on the wall too. So most of what we call cave art now, we're really talking about the parietal art, so-called. Uh, Europe's wall art sites are mostly from about 37,000 down to 15,000 years ago. And they're mostly down in either the Basque country or up in the lower part of France or going across the coast uh, towards Italy. Uh, there's the Chauvet cave site. Here's Lascaux up here in the Dordogne Valley. And Altamira caves uh, down there in Spain. The Behaviorally modern tools get rather fancy by the time you get to 25,000 years ago. I mean, take a look at some of these really fine points that have been made by uh, chipping away at uh, surrounding uh, rock. I mean, this one, for example, has got a good surface for your thumb. And of course, it looks like it ought to be very good at boring holes. And indeed, holes were bored. There's a sliver of bone that has been made into a needle. Here's another example of art. This is from Africa. It's uh, from Tanzania. This, in fact, shows a story. I mean, we have a damsel in distress here being rescued by her brothers against the invaders whose tensions are fairly clear if you consider the erect penis. But so within the 70,000 years, you see these behaviorally modern four Bs. Beads, blush for self-adornment, burials, and bone tools. And now with a, a real story depicted, we can finally say they probably thought a lot like we do now. So here's an art history quiz. From what century is the sculpture? Now I look at it, I initially think late 19th, early 20th century, something like that. But then I, I sort of look and see that this is pot shards that have been pasted back together. And I begin to wonder, well, it's from 3,800 years ago. Now, 1800 BCE is Contemporary with Middle Minoan on Crete, those bullfighting acrobats and so on. The book, I first saw them, I thought those almost modern looking kinds of artistic exaggeration. But here you have something at the same time. And really Europe, I mean, Minoan is Europe's oldest civilization, but it's got nothing like this thinker. So there's one more bit of stage setting that I'd like to do before considering phonemes, words, sentences, and stories. Focus for a minute on what size of a group are you communicating with? This is just your family, an extended family, a band of a few dozen, a tribe, chiefdom, state. Throughout nearly all of human evolution, the largest group was a band of several dozen people, often extended family groups that merged. 
That's also the size of the foraging bands you see in chimpanzees uh, and in bonobos. Basically, there was a bit of making them smaller and re-emerging as the food supply became uh, scarce. But when you think about it, in the 10,000 years when agriculture is now uh, supplemented, uh, hunter gatherers uh, limitations, that 10,000 years isn't very much time to change our genetics enough so that uh, we have inborn instincts that are focused on living in larger groups. Uh, just to show you a little bit of what uh, this transition occurred, uh, you have agriculture by at least 11,000, maybe a bit further back. Uh, but it's not agriculture that's sufficient to completely replace hunter-gathering. So population size is still limited pretty much uh, by the hunter-gathering lifestyle providing you with sufficient vitamins. Uh, and it, it takes a while to get three essential food groups that you can survive on without hunter-gathering. And that occurred by about 9,500 years ago in uh, China. They domesticated by then rice, millet, pigs, and silkworms. In the Levant, it was a different mix. It occurred by about 9,000 years ago. And in the Americas, uh, different groups were domesticated, but they did it by about 5,500 years ago. Uh, domesticating turns out to be difficult uh, because so many species turn out to be unsuitable uh, for domestication. By 5,400 years ago, the Sahara was losing its monsoon rainfall in the summers. And so they could, Sahara couldn't even support grass anymore. Therefore, no grazing animals, no lions, and no humans. Such rainfall reductions were not limited to the Sahara margin. She saw it all the way across Tigris, Euphrates Valley in Iraq, and in uh, the northern part of ancient China. So the great irrigation civilization was developed then, and they had a need for taxes to do all this, and an administrative core for it. They needed tax collectors and tax receipts so that people could show that already paid the correct number of bushels of wheat or uh, sheep. And the need for tax records is how writing began, about 3200 uh, BCE. And that enabled history to occur. And that changed everything. Dead people can now speak to us, as in the great edifice of well-tested scientific understanding still building. Language. Vervet monkeys have cries that specify danger. There's one cry that means danger above, such as eagles. Other cries really direct attention down below, such as the threat of snakes. Hundreds of nouns can be taught to animals, as well as verbs like fetch. And indeed, some categories uh, can be taught. African gray parrots are actually the best so far. But like having to teach reading and writing in humans, there's no real instincts that help you there. Uh, they must be patiently taught all these nouns. This is nothing like the staged acquisitiveness that you see in young humans. So we sort of assume that proto-language came first. Proto-language are the two-word sentences that give me this, give me that. Uh, none of the long sentences yet. It's the language of two-year-olds. It's 
It's also the language of uh, the pigeon languages that the traders use as they make various stops going down the river. They keep, speak a different pigeon at each place. They always have a lot of pointing gestures. Addition. Pointing gestures mean absolutely nothing to great apes. They just do not pay attention to that, nor do they pay attention to the direction that you're looking. An important kind of gesture. You gotta ask what were the payoffs for short sentence language? The first script suggestions were that of hunting, but then it turns out the chimps are already good at army patrol tactics. You don't need language to uh, coordinate that. The best of animal language learning, as they would dedicate the teachers really trying to get them to do uh, not only hundreds of words, but uh, sentences. Well, Kanzi, shown here, a bonobo, has managed to learn hundreds of nouns, and he can produce short sentences of the give me this, give me that variety. But he can understand human language, either pointing to the different symbols for the different words, or actually he can follow human speech better than anyone had thought possible. So Kansi can comprehend a novel sentence he's never heard before, such as go to the office and bring back the red ball. And Kanzi knows that there's an office and how to get there. He knows what red balls are, as distinguished from blue balls and so on. And indeed, the, um, the lab room where the sentence is spoken to him uh, is full of balls. They have all colors. And normally, the office doesn't have balls on it. But Kanzi ignores all the nearby balls, has to be let out of the room, and then once he's outdoors, he's, he has to be let into the office, where he's been many times before. And today, the office is full of all sorts of many colored balls. Uh, Kanzi finds the red ball amongst them, and then has to be let out, has to let me back into the test room, and delivers the ball. So he's understood a complicated sentence at about, the, it makes about the number of errors that a two and a half year old child would make. I mean, they tested some of the uh, graduate students' uh, children uh, in the same way, on the same tests, uh, and they made about 10% errors on the test, and so did Kanzi. So the way language quizdom goes is the first stage of quizdomness is just tuning up to the speech sounds in the dialect that you're listening to. Uh, this starts at maybe five or six months, quite intense up to 10 months. Uh, and basically, they are forming categories, so that minor variations in the way you say ga, 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 you know, are all standardized to one meaning, uh, which we call phonemes. And they learn all the ones that are in the stockpile of that particular dialect. So they stop responding. You can test them as to whether they can hear the differences or not, which you do in the months before, five months. And they, in fact, can hear all sorts of variation uh, that you and I can't hear at all. But then once they start making these categories, they can't hear the small changes anymore because they think it's all the same thing. So 
one of the things that makes it so hard for us to learn foreign languages because we will claim that. But I did say it exactly the way you said it. <laughs> and no, you can't hear the difference. So late in the first year, armed with these phonemes, they start learning combinations of phonemes, things that we call words. And they become very acquisitive with new words. Uh, sometimes they can even pick one up on one try. Uh, with this. this is not the sort of repetitive learning thing. They are really tuned up to get phoneme combinations down. And they average in the preschool years about six to nine new words every day. So there's nothing like this, obviously, in animal learning. And certainly not in the great apes that are tested, who really have no acquisitiveness at all, and it's really a rote repeat exercise to get them to have a vocabulary of several hundred. Now, by the second year, they're constructing two-word sentences, what we call proto-language. And the third year, they construct longer sentences using syntax to disambiguate the meanings. But like, like Kanzi, they were tuning in. They could understand longer sentences back in the second year. They just were not producing longer sentences. In the fourth and the fifth year, bedtime stories are now required to have a proper beginning, middle, and end. They have sort of got a template for what a good story is. And if the story is incomplete, incoherent, the child starts complaining about it. So the uh, overarching theme here seems to be keep making combinations of the latest set of combinations. So the infant makes a category, combines phonemes into a word, combines words into a short phrase, combines phrases into a longer sentence using syntax to help a listener guess the meaning, combines sentences into a proper story, and all of this, uh, and much of this is learned by uh, the youngster saying in the conversation of people who are gossiping. So they are hearing complicated sentences and they're tuning up to it. They're soft wiring their brain to do that particular language. All of this helps you think in greater depth and to juggle multiple things inside your head at once. So what did language start affecting this grand story about human evolution up from the apes to our kind of consciousness? This is a topic that the linguist Derek Bickerton and I addressed in our book, Linguax Machina. We said that vocabulary and short sentence language could easily have been building up for several million years. But long sentence utterances that need syntax and grammar to disambiguate a long string could be part of the creative explosion of the last 80,000 years. Uh, now that I've thought longer about social organization and group size, syntax and stories ought to flourish at the time of the transition from bands of dozens to uh, tribes of several hundred villages. In other words, more recently than 9,500 years ago. So the usual estimate of how many people you can keep track of, recognize readily, ask a question related to the last time you met, how many people can you do that for? And the usual estimate is several hundred individuals, sort of village size, the, the amalgamation of bands. In other words, you can feel comfortable meeting these individuals, not much worried that they will attack you or take advantage of your unguarded approach. 
Because if they did, such news would get around. We encounter many strangers daily in an urban setting, yet we have even less violent crime per capita than in the suburbs and the countryside. That's really quite remarkable. The social evolution since about 5,000 years ago has created this greater urban civility, but it is probably not yet backstopped by inherited instinct in the manner of cheater detection, which you need even back in dozen size bands. More than several hundred, and one is often associating with individuals who are strangers here today and gone tomorrow, whose misdeeds may not affect their reputation. They are, the cheaters among them will not worry that their misdeeds will catch up with them as they surely do within a hundred-sized uh, village. Yet bands of dozens were the rule until agriculture came along, allowing for higher population density and those villages of hundreds. So let us think back to the original group of several million years ago, the band of several extended family groups able to move out of Africa and get halfway to the North Pole. Small kills from clubbing with a long pole, such as birds and hares, are scarcely enough for a family to share. But these bands were also eating a lot of meat from large herbivores. Ever since about two and a half million years ago, you can see it in the isotope record. They were, and these are primarily grazers that they were eating. A kill that size is far too much to eat yourself. Food sharing beyond your own offspring is rare in primates. But here, a small group of hunters brings home an entire hindquarter of a big grazing animal. It's the perfect setup for sharing amongst an extended family or even a band-sized group of several dozen. But when sharing is required, you don't have to share small ones, but you have to share big ones, or maybe you have to share everything. Uh, these are going to vary between groups, and half of the adults in any one group are going to be from other bands. They are the females that moved as teenagers. They have been brought to different standards, and so there's always going to be a little tension in the group about whether somebody should have shared or not. So the, this mental estimating that's always going on is called cheater detection because uh, cheaters can really swap the whole cooperative venture if there get to be too many of them. One of the hazards of cities and uh, basically dealing with strangers whose reputation is not really at stake with what they do to you. The possible origins of such widespread cooperation are of interest. Besides keeping track of how exchanges balance out, individuals in a group of this size would be interested in alliances between individuals. I mean, even chimpanzees do this, that you see in grooming pairs, gifting, support during a fight. So even at the chimp bonobo level, one is not only keeping track of one of its own exchanges, but that of all the other possible pairings in the group. The direction of exchange and its value are what go into balancing estimates for each pair. This allows one to identify better partners and not waste time on individuals with a poor history of reciprocity, uh, those that are seen to be unhelpful. Now, this is kind of interesting from the standpoint of language. So once keeping track of all of these pairs, possible pairings in the group, the direction of the exchange and its value are what go into one's balancing estimates. Is the exchange symmetrical, unbalanced, whatever? 
But it turns out that this mental bookkeeping method needed for detecting cheaters might also serve as a foundation for long sentence language. Sharing involves three noun verbs, uh, give, bring. These are unusual verbs in that they have three nouns that have to be there. You utter a sentence that just says, give me. Well, you may be able to guess that uh, the speaker is one of the nouns. You still got to have a object given. Same thing for bring. You've got to have these three nouns. They're not optional. If you miss any one of the three, uh, somebody will look at you and say, what? Uh, you now see billboard advertisements that say, give me, and then there's a picture of uh, what's supposed to be given that's presumably hidden somewhere in the rest of the billboard. This is the analogous to the mental bookkeeping needed for keeping track of gifts and debits. Which pair? Directional exchange and value. The big step up from proto language is that long sentences are ambiguous unless you have some way of keeping track of which nouns go with which verbs in the sentence. I think I saw him leave to go home. It has four verbs on it. And by the third year, kids have started to figure this out. Just listening to all that adult conversation, especially gossip, uh, which always has sort of a little story in better than it. Uh, and of course, listening to gossip in the shade where people pounding and soaking plants is taking a lot of time and tool making is taking a lot of time and somebody's concentrating to get a fire started. I mean, this is what the shady environment that those kids are embedded in. If their brains may not have come tuned up uh, to speak Swahili, but if Swahili is being spoken, they will tune up to it, learn its words, learn its, its conventions that we call uh, grammar and syntax. So gossip in the shade is sort of the perfect setting here. So as far as I can see, you need these things. You need vocal mimicry which may come rather late. Much mimicry can be seen in even in bird brains. So, I mean, it is that difficult to do. However, uh, great apes don't do it very well. And for most of our history in a band-sized social group, uh, we may not have done very well either. But I can describe for you a transition uh, that would bring you into most people being able to do long sentences. You need some to get it started. So imagine that some adults or maybe just older children slowly manage to consistently speak long sentences. Now you have got some conventions that they have either invented themselves or learned elsewhere. You've got to remember that their groups are always exchanging members in the way of uh, teenage females. So if there is some convention, I mean, for example, you develop a case marking convention that identifies who's an actor, who's an acted upon. I mean, we use he and him, for example, in that manner. So now small children hear stuff with structures like that. They figure out the syntax and are better as adults because earlier experience and soft wiring around it works better as an adult. So 
So before, you may have words and short sentences, but after early exercise from things like gossip, you might not only have more long sentences, but more complex thoughts, more contingent plans, and the ability to play games and exercise logic, music beyond melody, polyphonic music, and most of all, since all of this involves a problem of quality, of finding a coherent combination before you speak it out loud, uh, this kind of coherence finding creativity is very rewarding, it seems. So all of these things I'll discuss next time, but they all seem to be uh, the stuff of higher intellectual function. Uh, there are three of my books that have more depth that you might want to take a look at. So here's where we are in the series. These are the things that we did before. Here's the current lecture. And the next one will be our kind of looking ahead. Creativity and planning and the higher intellectual functions. Thank you.